Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, The Department of Truth, number eight, from Image Comics, written by James Tynan IV, with artwork by Martin Simmons and lettering by Aditya Bidikar. This book is utterly fascinating to me. So it's about conspiracy theories and the Department of Truth and the idea that the more people believe in crazy conspiracy theories, the more reality changes to fit these conspiracy theories, right? That's a crazy idea. Taking the idea of conspiracy theories being kind of like dangerous mistruths that infect populations and also taking into account the idea that belief changes reality. Two different ideas that work so well together, especially when they're juxtapositioned against each other the way James Tynion does. This book has got so much deep, enriching mystery, it just keeps me locked in. For every conspiracy theory that's explained and how it's affecting the reality of the world of the Department of Truth, the more questions, the more labyrinthian I said that way wrong. The more like crazy conundrums and puzzles this book presents, I'm loving it. The main character, Cole, who's recently been inducted into the Department of Truth, is starting to question whether or not they're actually preserving the, the true truth or their version of truth. And it starts getting into all of this stuff about what is truth, what is reality, is it subjective, is it objective, where is that thin, wavy line, where is it? And, and, and how does one manage that? I love it. The artwork by Martin Simmons is amazing. Rough, raw, innovative, um, brilliant, textured, beautiful, big, bombastic moments that really fit the creepy, moody, menacing atmosphere of the story and the subject matter. And really intricate and detailed and dense storytelling wrapping a bunch of exposition all up into one visual feast. Aditya Bidikar is stretching himself as far as a letterer goes, stretching what a letterer can do and bring to a book as far as, as a resonant quality, as far as affecting atmosphere and tone. Aditya does that perfectly, masterfully well. That's why, to me, Department of Truth is just one of the best image books out, and it is, to me, the best book of the week. Lots of good books, but for me, it's pick of the week because just everybody on the entire creative team is just doing next level work. Department of Truth number eight out this week from Image. We got a couple new fantasy number ones from Image. First up, we have Helm Grey Castle. Helm Grey Castle. So y'all know already, I'm not the biggest fantasy fan. So usually these kind of things, they can be all right. And sometimes I get certain, like really into certain stories. And other times it's just all right. This one to me was just kind of all right. I kind of felt lost when I first started reading this book. I was like, so this is like a D&D &D campaign, right? And then they added in some, so it's like typical fantasy D&D &D type lore. And then they're adding in some Aztec stuff. So that was interesting enough, but the mesh just didn't work. None of the characters resonated with me. The art was pretty solid, though, so it's got nice artwork. If you like nice D&D &D set things um, with decent artwork, maybe you should check this one out. It also is it's $5. It's like a normal size story, but it's got all this stuff in the back that I, I assume is like a D&D &D type campaign or something. So that's neat, just not usually my bag, so it didn't really resonate very well with me. But Helm Grey Castle number one is out this week. We also have Summoner's War Legacy number one. So this is by Justin Jordan. It's another fantasy book. It's about these magicians in this world um, where there are summoners and they can summon like elementals or creatures, maybe demons, things like that, right? And there's this giant war going on between all of them. And I'm reading this and I'm like, it's all right. It was was a little bit more engaging to me than the Helm Grey Castle. Um, not as intricate, I guess, but like less confusing and more streamlined and kind of punchy as well. Um, but it still just didn't completely grab me. And at one point I was like, this feels like it's a video game or something. Then I get to the end and guess what? This is based on a video game. 
I am so unaware of video games. I have no idea. I'm just reading this book. I'm like, this feels like a video game. Well, Robbie, it is. Anyway, that's out. So if you're a big fan of that book, you should check it out. Crossover is here with issue number six. This is the conclusion to the first arc of Donny Cates and Jeff Shaw's um, crossover book, which has promised to have a lot of crossovers with like other characters from other companies, maybe things like that. Well, yeah, it is true. Now we've seen some already. Um, Mike Allred's Madman has been involved. Elliot Ray Hall and Donny Cates's Paybacks have been involved. And in crossover number six, a whole lot more get involved. So just being a comic book fan, and that's what this book is for. It's about the importance of being a comic book fan, or at least the importance of being a comic book fan to a comic book fan. So there are some nice revelations in here, some nice twists and turns. It's got an ending that really hit me. Um, it got me excited to see what's coming on, how that revelation gets extended upon or, you know, built up with. But this book had some nice emotional moments. It had some big bombastic moments. It, This book, at least, I don't know if we were promised that there were going to be a lot of different, like, characters that we knew in the pages of crossover, but it was a promise that we at least thought of, <laughs> at least making to ourselves. It fulfills that promise. Crossover number six was big, bombastic, but at the same time, had moments of drama tragedy and a really solid ending that completely shifts the focus of the story. I loved it. Crossover number six. There you go. Shadecraft number two is here with a more well-balanced second issue than the first issue was. I thought the first issue was all right. It's about this young woman who has recently lost her brother. Well, not really lost him, but he's in a coma. He's had like an accident or something. And then all of a sudden she starts um, hearing her brother's voice and his her brother's essence, soul, if you will, is like her shadow. So it's kind of attached. She's the only one that can see it. And there's shadow powers involved and other things like that. So it's got a nice like down-to-earth type sense to it, but in the midst of this fantastic thing happening. And issue two, I thought, was way more balanced than the first one. The first one felt a bit uneven. Um, this one flowed a little bit better. The dialogue flowed. The characters started becoming a bit more captivating and compelling. So Shadecraft number two, I thought, was an improvement on the first issue. Not saying that the first issue was bad, but it was just a little uneven for me. But issue number two is starting to kind of even that out. It's uneven, so you even it out. I could have come up with a better word. Come on. Spawn number 317 is here. I'm having so much fun being a Spawn fan. It's literally changed my life. Good things have happened um, if you're a Spawn fan. Trust me, it's amazing. Spawn 317 is kind of finally wrapping up this big battle that's been going on with the Omega Spawn. You got Medieval Spawn, and you got Spawn Spawn, and now you got Plague Spawn, and they're all fighting Omega Spawn, and it makes this Robbie Spawn just spawn freaking tastically excited. Let me tell you that. Spawn, um, first of all, Todd McFarlane still brings an energy to this book, and the artwork is done by Carlo Barberi, and I'm typically not the biggest fan of his work, but it seems like any artist that I think is just kind of average or inconsistent or mediocre just gets like enlivened by working with McFarlane. There's something about Spawn that's exciting. It's never the best written book. Sometimes it's not even the best um, executed book artistically, but it is always fun and it's always consistent and it's still $2.99 Spawn. I'm having so much fun. Like we're getting into the whole into the Spawnverse type stuff. And I'm just loving it. I unplug something in my head and I just ride this out. I have so much fun. Spawn 317, one of the best values in comic shops for sure. Bitterroot number 12 is here with a kind of a game-changing issue. I really like this book. I really like this story. It's kind of like... It's about like these monster demon hunters, you know, they're a, they're a family. Um, back in the 1920s, a lot of the attention is focused on Harlem. Some of it's in the South. There's a lot going on in the book. And the way that Chuck Austin, David F. Walker, and Sanford Green balance it all. It feels rather chaotic at times, but it, it also at the same time has such a coherent structure to the story. The characters all have their distinct personality and the story just keeps ramping up. It keeps becoming more complex. It keeps twisting and turning and providing new mysteries that keep us engaged in what's coming ahead. Bitterroot is one of the most undervalued comic books on shelves right now. Number 12 is out this week. If you like monster hunting goodness, I highly encourage you to check it out. Let's check out DC. We got a new Robin book, Robin number one, written by Joshua Williamson with artwork by, is it Gleeb Melnikov? Something like that. The artwork's pretty cool. It's got a definitive, like, manga style. It's definitely influenced by it. Um, but it works. It's got some nice action to it. And this is following the journey of Damian Wayne. So Damian Wayne 
has given up not he's see definite manga influence right there there's literally manga in the book damien reads it that's cool um so damien has kind of gone off on his own he's trying to kind of almost mimic what bruce did when bruce went off and traveled the world to become batman um he's kind of doing that he's done with the teen titans he's done with the bat family and he just wants to make his own way and so how does dc and joshua williamson want to convey this journey how about through a mortal freaking combat tournament that's exactly what's going on in this page in the pages of robin number one it's basically damian wayne entering mortal combat now of course it's not Liu kang it's not kung lao it's not johnny or it's johnny cash or or cole young Ooh, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to trigger anybody there. Um, but Robin, number one, is a pretty solid issue. Damian Wayne and other familiar faces in the DC Universe in this once every hundred years tournament of the League of Lazarus, which is an offshoot of the League of Shadows and the League of Assassins. So it's doing some interesting um, tweaking on the mythology of the League, of Rachel Ghoul, of Damian, of his legacy. And like I said, it's Damian Wayne in Mortal Kombat, and that was pretty fun, and it's just getting going. But overall, I liked it. I thought the artwork had a lot of energy to it. I thought the story was good, and I thought the voice of Damian rang a bit more truer in Joshua Williamson's hand than it does in other writers. Robin number one, very solid. Detective Comics 1035 is here. Dan Mora doing the art. That's really all we need on a Batman book right now. The artwork is amazing, and seriously, Jordi Belair, right? Yeah, Jordi Belair's coloring is fan freaking tastic. It pops. It feels superhero-y. But the story is a grounded, rooted, noirish detective story. It's detective comics, and every once in a while they remember that and they go, "Hey, maybe we should tell a detective story." And I really like what they're doing here. They're adding some elements to the lore of Gotham. They're they're really focusing on the new mayor. This whole anti-vigilante thing. Um, and focusing in on the character of Bruce and other things like that. But it's that artwork by Dan Moore that truly sells this book. Oh my goodness, the Bat books right now, both Detective and Batman, have some of the best superhero artwork on shelves. And I guess they should because it's Batman. But Detective Comics 1035, I was very pleased with that. It's got a Huntress backup story too that I like. So it's nice to see a backup story that I like because I didn't like the backup story in Action Comics. It's a Midnighter backup story. And I just have not been digging this Midnighter stuff that they've been doing. I love that character, but I think I'm just going to start skipping those backup stories. But let me tell you something. This Action Comics issue, the issue of the Superman book itself, was freaking awesome. You got to be kidding me. Philip Kennedy Johnson is doing something amazing with this Superman book. He's 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 like anchoring it in this journey of a father feeling his grip on his son loosen like seeing your son grow up or something like that right and so it's kind of sentimental and that's what's been being built on in the last few books but we know that we're leading up into this whole idea of superman going off into space and jonathan taking over on earth so you got this like you know passing the baton passing the torch the legacy idea, right? And and the sadness and the reflection that goes on. That's all cool. But this book is big. It's got some great world building. It's got the character of Kal-El perfectly right. Um, Mongol is uh, the biggest focus as a villain here, War World Rising. Phil Kennedy Johnson is adding new elements to the idea of War World, but totally respecting everything that came before. And also, for the first time in a long time, Mongol feels threatening. Like, ever since Jeff Johns introduced him into the Sinestro Corps, which I thought was a brilliant idea at the time, it just feels like Mongol's never gotten the respect since then that he really, truly deserves. You feel it in here. You feel it because of the way the story is structured, the way the story is written, the way it's paced out. But it's the art that gives it its full weight and gravity. Holy cow. Great composition. Weighty figures. Like I said, this gives the story the gravity. And look at those majestic poses on Superman in the midst of a great double page spread telling a great story showing kinetically charged action just right there big explosive and at the same time telling a great story that's grounded in some real human drama and human emotion kudos station Action Comics was freaking fantastic. Batman Superman number 17 is here. Gene Loon Yang and Ivan Reese doing, continuing the story that they started in the last one. So now Batman Superman in the age of the Omniverse and the DC Infinite Frontier um, is going to be focusing on the Batman and Superman of other realities. So you got this one Batman in a very like 40s, 50s aesthetic, like 
like newsreel and then like the same with Superman, but a little bit more hokey, right? But they're, they both kind of feel hokey. But you got two, like a Superman from another Earth and a Batman from a completely different Earth kind of thrown together, teaming up against uh, an ultra threat, which is really cool, which also affects the uh, the Prime Earth or whatever they want to call it. Now, Earth Zero, Superman and Batman. It's a real fun story. I like the artwork. I think it does some interesting things with how it's telling the story um, through the newsreel and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I like it. The artwork's big. It's got a lot of action. This feels like a good, old-school, fun comic book, and that's great, and that's what Batman Superman should be. It's a book that relies on the brand, but now I actually feel like it's got a little bit of a direction, um, and it's just a lot of fun. Batman Superman 17, super fun. Harley Quinn number two. Didn't like this issue as much as the first one, but I'm still liking Stephanie Phillips' take on the character. I'm loving Riley Rosmo's artwork. It's not going to be the artwork most people are looking for when they pick up a Harley Quinn book, but for me, it really works. It tells the story. It's got this zany quality to it that I think is very appropriate to the story, to the character. And I think Stephanie Phillips understands and gets the voice of Harley Quinn and gets the journey that she's on right now. And I'm feeling it. I'm vibing with it. I like it. I like it a lot. This book is getting a little bit more into her road of redemption and how she can help share that with other former Joker henchmen who may be seeking redemption themselves. So it's still quirky, but not obnoxiously so. Issue number two just didn't come across st quite as strong as the first one, um, but I still did like it. Harley Quinn number two. Two issues in, I'm liking Harley. I'm liking more Harley Quinn books now than I ever have in my life. That's pretty dope. Teen Titans Academy number two is out. It, I just do not like this book. I know a lot of people have a connection to Teen Titans because of old school comics and stuff. I know a lot of people have connections to this Red X stuff because of the Teen Titans animated series, but I have a connection to neither, and I just don't like it. First of all, I'm loving Tom Taylor and Bruno Rondondo's uh, Nightwing right now. That Nightwing and the pages of those books does not feel like the Nightwing here. Completely different vibe, and this is not a good take on Nightwing for me. Now, maybe he's a little bit more broody and, and just, <laughs> just maybe he's a little bit more like that when he's in the Teen Titans, but... It's not vibing with the character right now in Blue Haven and seeing that how it fits in. I don't know, whatever. But the Red X mystery is not really doing anything for me. It's a whole new batch of kids, so I guess there will be some first appearances. There is the mystery of Red X. I'm sure that reveal is going to be exciting to some people. This is what this book is based on, is who is Red X? And it's about this the, the Titans kind of trying to teach the new generation, right? So it's introducing new characters. as They're kind of doing it like a school. But the problem is Strange Academy is it, exists, and is so far way better at doing that than Teen Titans Academy. So I'm not really connected with what's going on, and I'm just not digging the flow of it. And I think that over at Marvel with Strange Academy, they're kind of doing the same idea, but a whole lot better. But I'm probably going to keep reading it just because I want to know who Red X is going to be. Ruby, Justice League number one. So Ruby is an anime manga, something like that, right? So this is not necessarily like a crossover of the Justice League that you know and love into the world of Ruby. This is like a rubification of the Justice League. It's like as if they exist in their world. So it's a different, completely different version of Superman, a completely different version of Wonder Woman. But I guess more in line with Ruby in the world of Ruby. I've never watched or read Ruby, so I, I felt lost and confused. The artwork was nice. I thought it was cool. It did some interesting things, but it just didn't grab me. But like I said, it's... I think this is more for Ruby fans and less for, for Justice League fans. Um, but it did have some nice artwork that I liked um, and some interesting interpretations of the characters. So that is out. If you're a Ruby fan, you definitely want to check that out. And Batman Black and White issue number five, the penultimate issue of this go-round. Um, I love this issue. Not quite as strong as issue number two, which to me has been by far the best of the series so far. But a whole lot better than the last couple. This one was ballin'. I really liked it. So first of all, you got a story in here by Jorge Jimenez. So seeing Jorge Jimenez's his artwork in black and white, it's great. He tells a nice simple story about Batman and Damien planning an operation, and then it has a nice little punchline thing at the end. You got a Lee Weeks Gordon-centric story that is really cool and will make you throw back to the days. You got a Emmanuel, Emanuela Lupacino a story. I think that's uh, Marika Tamaki doing that, the writing on that one. Yes, it is. And this was actually kind of a boring story. It kind of focused on Gilda Dent, but that was that was the dud of the bunch for me. Then you got Karen Gillan and James McKelvey doing a choose your own adventure. Like each panel is numbered. 
And then sometimes it'll be like, go to page 26 to head through your new passage. I eventually just read the whole thing straight through to try to piece together the story because I kept killing Batman. Straight up. And then you got a, you got a, uh, it's a Jamal Campbell, right? Yeah, Jamal Campbell Nightwing story that's nice and fun. It's got some really, really solid artwork. So all in all, a really great issue of Batman Black and White with some really cool, fun stories with great artwork by some highly talented individuals. Let's jump over to Marvel where we have the Marvel's number one, written by Kurt Busiek with artwork by Bill DeRay Sinar. I really, first of all, like this book. I love the artwork. It's really cool. It does introduce a new character, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but this is one of the best Kurt Busiek books I've read in a long time. I grew up in the 90s, in my teenage years, really big into Kurt Busiek. Untold Tales of Spider-Man, Astro City, um, then Thunderbolts, then Avengers. Just loved his work, right? Um, and in recent years, I feel like the work that's been out there from him hasn't just been the best, right? This is like true to form. This is like Avengers Forever level writing from Kurt Busiek, which I think is just one of his best works outside of like Astro City. Um, the Marvels is great, and it's kind of like not just Avengers Forever as far as quality of the script, but also kind of like the story. Like Avengers Forever was this all-encompassing Avengers story that took characters from all different eras of Avengers mo uh, histories and milestones and threw them together and just told this one big gigantic story. And now Busick's kind of doing that with the whole Marvel Universe. So it's a spin on the idea of Marvels. But if Marvels was about the heroes from ordinary people's perspectives, this is about the universe from the perspective of the heroes. So you got heroes that you know and love from different eras all forming together a team, but there's a whole lot more than that. You got some Punisher action in here. You got Captain America. You got some Spider-Man. And you got some pretty solid artwork all the way through. I thought this was incredibly well done. It felt like an old school comic. It felt fun. It felt intriguing. It felt incredibly rooted in the past, present, and future of Marvel Comics, I freaking loved it. The Marvels, number one, and an Alex Ross cover. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. We got Beta Ray Bill, issue number two, out from Daniel Warren Johnson. I, I love it. I love it. If you, if you didn't like issue number one, I don't know if you'll like this one because that establishes the tone. Highly energetic, incredibly funny, um, striking a little bit of a melodramatic chord, in, in, an es in essence, it's straight up superhero comic books at their best. I love Daniel Warren's artwork, the, the, the energy in here, cool tricks like that where you see a cross section of the ship. Um, that's totally old school comics. I love the way that he fits so much in. There's so much detail, so much density um, on each page, but the energy when it needs to explode and erupt just does it. Daniel Warren Johnson is a master of comic book sequential storytelling, and he's got a great sense of fun and buoyancy to his books and it comes right across in Beta Ray Bill. This isn't quite as heavy as something like Wonder Woman Dead, Dead Earth, but it's just as explosive. I loved it. Beta Ray Bill number two, solid. Miles Morales, Spider-Man 25, and this starts Miles' clone saga. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's because all of us that were, had, to, had to suffer through the clone saga are old enough now to be nostalgic about it which there is some truth to that, to be honest. I've been thinking real hard about doing a Clone Saga Comics Revisited. Um, but Miles gets his own Clone Saga, so we knew that this dude was trying to clone Miles several issues ago, and it's been building up since then. But this was overall a really fun issue. It's extra size because it's got an extra story in the back. The extra story is just kind of cute and charming and fun, but it's nothing really to write home to Mother about. But the main story was interesting. I think Saladin Ahmed oh, completely understands the, the, the vibe and flow of the character and of Brooklyn, but he's really starting to pace his scripts out a whole lot better. It doesn't feel quite as verbose and weighted down by the narration or weighted down by the dialogue. It actually has a nice flow to it. The artwork by Carmen Canero, pretty freaking solid. You got some nice dramatic moments involving Miles and Genki that I just thought were really well done. And you got an appearance by Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And you got some clone action. So I actually really liked it. I know a lot of times we hear Spider-Man clone saga and we go, ugh. But, I mean, this was pretty fun and it was pretty cool and it was completely different. And it... I really like the ending too. I thought I'm really excited 
to see where it's going to go, guys. Fantastic Four is here with issue number 31. This is a really great issue of Fantastic Four. It's just one of those one-and-done stories that fits perfectly in between bigger stories that really deals with each character and each character's relationship. In particular, Reed and uh, Ben and Johnny and Sue and then Alicia and the new kids and all kinds of stuff. This was a really well-done issue of Fantastic Four, written by Dan Slott with artwork by R.B. Silva. I really feel like Slott has been able to focus and hone in on this book, maybe since like he's not doing Iron Man now, maybe since he's devoting more energy to this. It's, it's, it's definitely coming across. Or he got a new ghostwriter, but I'm really liking it. And another thing, another big change that's really helped the momentum and flow of this book has been the addition of R.B. Silva on the artwork. The artwork is great. It's a nice, fun story about exploration, about the family drama. It's hitting all the notes on the head of what I want out of a Fantastic Four book. Cosmic fun adventure and fel uh, family melodrama uh, melodramatic superheroics. Fantastic Four is pretty great. I really like it. Savage Avengers number 30 is here. Um, so what would happen if Conan helped Rhino rob a bank and Spider-Man got involved and then they fought? Well, if you ever wanted to know that answer, read Savage Avengers number 20. I'm having so much fun with this. It's pretty much roadhouse in comic book form, meaning that it's not taking itself too seriously. Uh, Jerry Duggan and company, Patrick Zercher does amazing artwork here. They know exactly the book that they're making, and they're, they're just having a lot of fun with it, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Some really great clean artwork, classic comic book style, and some real fun interactions between Spider-Man and Conan. Um, this book is Conan in the modern-day Marvel Universe. It shouldn't work, but it does work because it's just dumb, fun, ridiculous, awesome Savage Avengers number 20 out this week. Then we got the return of Black Widow. Kelly Thompson's been doing a really good job with Black Widow. You know, when the initial story arc first started, and you have this idea that Black Widow now has a new life. She doesn't remember her life as Black Widow. She's got a husband. She's got a kid. And then you find out what actually happened. And now she has to step away from this life. And so she's dealing, like, with some post-tragedy type stuff, right? Um, but that doesn't stop this book, first of all, from letting that resonate and continue to add emotional weight to the story, but it doesn't stop the flow of the energy. The book is still very, very action-packed. There's a lot going on here, um, and Kelly Thompson just does a great job. Now, we got, stepping in on the art, we got a guest artist, Rafael uh, De La Torre, which I love. Really great artwork, really great uh, composition, especially on some of the action scenes. There are some moments in here that pop so freaking well. There's some moments that feel a little bit like, what's the movie where they have to keep going up the level of the uh, of each floor? Moon Knight did like a spin on, was it The Raid or something? Anyway, they kind of have their own take and spin on that. But Black Widow, a great book that actually gets into the nitty gritty of the character and not in a way that's actually been done to death about Natasha and also delivers some really fun uh, superhero action. Black Widow number six, Really great book. Cable number 10 is here. This book is kind of winding down a little bit. Jerry Duggan's, uh, I think it's only got one issue left, maybe two, but they're now building it all up to its head. Um, and at the same time, they're taking moments like this is kind of like a filler issue, but a lot gets progressed in the midst of this other side mission, right? Which I do kind of like. I like when comic books can do that, where they can tell a story that's all one and done, but at the same time, still driving the actual plot of the book forward, the ongoing subplots and everything. I've really been enjoying Cable. Uh, I love this iteration of Kid Cable. I like Phil Noto's artwork, so I'm going to be sad to see this one go, but I'm not ever really too sad to see an X-Men book go away because... There are a lot of them nowadays, and they just can't all be appealing, right? So Cable number 10, I do like. I did not read New Mutants, though. Just didn't read it. If you read it and you liked it, let me know. X-Men Legends number 3 is here. This is Louise Simonson, Walt Simonson, returning back to the pages of X-Factor to tell us an untold tale of their X-Factor. So it's very old school, just like what came before it with the Fabian Issyes, the Brett Bo Booth book. That felt very 90s. This feels very late 80s. Um, this was an era of X-Factor that I read and loved as a kid. The Apocalypse stuff. So it's nice to see some Apocalypse action. It's nice to see Archangel back, like that that version of Archangel. Um, so you got some really cool stuff. This is, this is for old school fans. I don't think a lot of new school people are going to really get too much appreciation out of this. Um, 
I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. X-Men Legends number three, taking us back to those X-Factor days. Let's jump over to Boom Studios where we have Berserker. Did he just watch him? So Berserker number two is finally here. I got the shiny foil cover. There's two covers, two main covers, I guess you could say, and they both have foil versions of them, so that's pretty nifty. Um, Keanu Reeves, Matt Kent, Ron Garney, uh, we already know this, Bill Crabtree, we know what this book is. It's kind of like a Wolverine in a way, a little bit of a different take. Um, Keanu Reeves plays a, uh, <laughs> plays a, a Wolverine, like an immortal. And we find out in the first issue that he's an immortal and he's working for the U.S. government and he's just badass and just punches straight through people. It's very brutal, very gory, very bloody, very violent. Issue two continues that, but it does also reveal the entire origin, pretty much, of the Berserker, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. I really like what Ron Garney's doing here on the art style. I think this book has been delayed a little bit because they replaced the initial artist with Ron Garney. They wanted to go for more of a Frank Miller, Klaus Janssen type style, and I think that's what they're doing, but then there are moments where it expands out from that and gets really kind of psychedelic and cool, and then right back to that brutal, bloody, just savage, textless stuff, but also some really nice... Uh, character work that's being done because just like in the first issue it's kind of framed all around the berserker himself um talking to like his psychiatrist or his doctor or something like that um so all in all two issues are in and it's nothing that's like changing the way comic books are made it's nothing changing it's nothing supremely innovative but it is fun and i'm having a lot of fun with it and and it, at the same time it's trying to do something a little bit more than that and, and it's also trying to do something more than that because it's definitely setting... These are storyboards for a, for a movie or TV show, right? But anyway, I'm, I love it. And if they keep going, doing foil covers, I'll, I'm just going... If they keep punching through people's heads, giving us a little bit of emotional resonance in each issue, and giving foil covers, that book could go 250 issues. I'd buy every one of them. Once in Future, issue number 18 is here, wrapping up the third arc of the story in magnificently heavy way like wow okay once in future has been a great book and i think it's a book that people are starting to take for granted they're just like okay once in future's here it's always going to be a nice fun consistent book with some of the best artwork on shelves because it of course is dan mora providing the line work which is even more meticulous and well crafted than his detective work but then you got tamra bond villain providing some of the best colors on comic pages as of right now. So you're telling this big bombastic story. We're used to this. It's going to be amazing artwork. It's going to be a nice fun adventure story um, by way of like Indiana Jones or something like that. And then you get to the end of this issue and it sets up so much high stakes craziness that's right on the next page, like right over into the next issue. Like I could not be more excited for the future of this book. Um, Wow, what an ending. Big, bold, dramatic, game-changing, at least for the pages of Once and Future. Issue number 18, masterful. Well done. Abbott 1973 is here with issue number four, the penultimate issue of the second volume of Abbott. And I will say that overall four issues in, and it's not wrapped up yet, but the first one had a little bit more density and complexity to it as far as the story goes, as far as the, the character work goes. This one feels a little bit more just kind of even a little bit more just kind of average um and the artwork losing jason uh wordy on the coloring i think it really kind of hurt the book but if there's just also not there's there's a level of complexity to me that's missing in the artwork because sammy cavella is not quite approaching what he did in the first volume um ayakano's doing a great job coloring but it's not quite providing the texture and the complexity that we got in the coloring in the first volume. And I also feel like the story and the characters aren't getting as much. So this feels like a watered down version of Abbott. And that kind of saddens me. We only got one issue left. Um, but I do love this character. I love this world. It's supernatural, uh, detective, investigative, uh, journalism, uh, noir in the 70s in Detroit. And, and I like the whole world and the idea. And I love the first book. But this second one's just been a little bit thin for me. So that's out from Boom this week. We also have Shadow Doctor number three from Aftershock. I'm um, loving this book. Peter Calloway, Georges Genty, um, love this book. It's a tr based on a true story um, about a dude who, a black man, 
in the early like 1900s. He wants to be a doctor. Nobody will give him a loan so he can set up his practice. And he knows Al Capone because he used to run around with Al Capone back in the day. And Al gives him the money to start his thing. And of course, you know that's going to lead into Capone kind of needing his services. And that's what we get here. But we also get some really great um, other stories that are framed around about the dude's past. And there's this riddle and the way that those are juxtaposed against each other, the way that they reflect each other thematically, I thought was absolutely brilliant and really, really solid. Shadow Doctor number three. This is a book more people need to be reading and talking about it. Number three was fantastic. And each issue just keeps getting better because it keeps building on what's come before into something really exciting. Nuclear Family number three is here. So I really liked issue number one. This is by Stephanie Phillips and Tony uh, Shastine. And it's about... It's like this, this, it's about, okay, this, this family in 1958 suburban America. Um, and then all of a sudden they, like, nuclear warfare happens. And next thing you know, it's like 10 years later, they're the only house standing. And all these people that they should know don't remember them. And, and the military's like captured them and they think they're like commie spies. So that's interesting. So issue number one was solid. Issue number two really enriched that mystery revealed some things, got us excited. And issue number three, it just kind of meandered around. I don't really feel like issue three accomplished much. It put the focus on the kids. Maybe that was the whole point. It introduced a new character, but it didn't really do anything to take the concept that I'm getting into from issue one into two, and it didn't do anything to move it forward. It didn't do anything to answer some questions and also bring up new ones. At the end of this issue, I was kind of felt like, what happened? Like, I don't feel like we really went very far, but we'll see what happens in further issues. That being said, artwork's still solid. Starting to feel a little bit stiff, though, for me in issue number three, but I am still intrigued by the story, but I just wish it went a little bit further in issue number three. I Breathed a Body, number four. This is by Andy McDonald and Zach Thompson, uh, Hassan Osman El Hal, Triona Farrell. I've been loving this book. It's like Clive Barker meets the social networks, what they're saying. So I say it's like, yeah, it's exactly like that. It's like Hellraiser, um, but it's about technology. And Zach Thompson's been kind of exploring this in some of his horror fiction of late, this connection between humanity and technology and how that connection is saying things about our connections to each other and to ourselves. So some really great, strong thematic things are happening here. Plus we're dealing with the some fungal horror that's a bit unclear and they start really getting into that in issue number four and it just left me behind like it, it was like two pages in and then i was always behind on this book i was just every page i was just like huh what and that's not a bad thing i mean like this book was challenging it was hard for me to kind of grasp some of the concepts and what was happening but then as i struggled through it and it wasn't necessarily a struggle because it was very rewarding. When I got to the end of this book, blew me away. Blew me away. I Breathe the Body is something cerebral. It's something intensely horrific. Um, and not just because of anything like gory, though there's plenty of that in here. Um, it's because of what it's saying about who we are as humans, as a society, and what we've allowed to happen. And what we've allowed control uh, you know, th yeah, like the control we've relinquished. Like this book is really freaking horrific and in all the right ways. I loved it. I breathe the body number four out this week. We got some new ones from Scout. Let's talk about them. Galactic Rodents of Mayhem. This kind of like immediately you're like, so this is kind of like a take on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. Yes, it is. It's kind of like that a little bit different. Um, it's not as well done. It's interesting. It's got some promise. This is a non-stop issue. What that means is that there's an issue number one. So you can pick it up, read it, see what you think about it. And then there are no more issues. You just got to wait for the graphic novel that will be coming out a few months later. Um, so it was decent. It was interesting. You even have them kind of riffing on the fact that they know there's going to be a comparison to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So they have their own version of the turtles in here. So it was fun. It was goofy. It was sci-fi. But it didn't quite fully scratch that TMNT itch. But it was pretty decent. So there you go. Snatched, number one, is a new one from Scout Comics. It's about the illegal underground hair market. So apparently this is a real thing. I looked into this, right? Uh, there is a market. Like, people will like sell hair illegally, right? Uh, 
So, I mean, it sounds crazy, but like people die for this stuff, right? So the book is trying to explore this world, but it does it in a very incoherent type way where it doesn't ever come together and make sense. And it does feel rather silly and it doesn't give, the premise itself doesn't feel like it should have weight. But when you start looking into it, the idea of people getting killed for, you know, for the people, the idea of any kind of like sex trade or any kind of human slavery or anything like that, human trafficking, that's kind of what it's tied up in. That's a very heavy subject. This book tries to do that, but it does it to me in a juvenile way and slightly incoherent, doesn't bring it together, doesn't work, and it kind of makes the whole premise and concept rather silly. So I just did not like this one. Snatched, number one. Eh. Steak, number two. So I missed out on reading Steak, number one. So I did finally find my copy. I read Steak, number one. I read Steak, number two. I love this book. It's amazing. It's like perfect for fans of Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Blade or The Lost Boys. If you like vampire fiction, um, you should totally check out Steak because it's obvious that the creators do too. David A. Byrne, Francisca Fantini. It's got black and white with a splash of color here and there, mostly yellow and red, and it really works so freaking well. So Steak is social media influence, wannabe influencer, um, and a vampire hunter, or she wants to be a vampire hunter. The first issue did a great job of setting up who she was and what this book was going to be about. And the second issue just keeps on going. And I loved it. I love the artwork. It's very dynamic. It's got a great flow to it. Um, the story itself is weighty. It's a little bit complex. There's some density to the, to the, the, to the flow of the book. So it's not something that you just breeze right through, but it's so worth it. Stake number two, like I said, this is for vampire fans because they reference so much vampire lore from fiction, from movies, from comics. I mean, it's great. Her name is Angel, and at times they keep calling her Buffy. It's it's just, it's like a book made for me. I loved it. Steak number two, fan freaking tastic. Love that book. From Vault, we have Witch Blood number two. This is like a biker movie. It's like a biker movie uh, meets witches and vampires. You know, so we've seen tons of fiction where it's like vampires versus werewolves, vampires versus witches. That's what this is. It's vampires versus witches in a very... Like, <clears throat> Grindhouse is the wrong word. It's not Grindhouse, but it's 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 definitely a more buoyant, fun, um, it's got weight to it, but it's 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 got this sense of fun, and it's very colorful. It's got a scene in it that totally reminds me of Near Dark, and a great moment where, seriously, right here, you get an editor's note that says, note to the reader, before turning the page, we encourage you to find a way to start Alan Jackson's Chattahoochee. So I did. And then I go to this page and read it along as I was listening to that song, and it works so freaking well. Um, so it's witches versus vampires, and it's mostly focused on this character, um, and the Ramblin' Rose is her bike. Um, it's got this weird, fun, vibrantly free and, and, and edgy style to it, but it's also got this very bright and, and fun aspect to it. I don't know, Witch Blood number two is hard to kind of put my finger exactly on what I think about it makes it work. It is the sense of unabashed fun, but and also the idea that it's leaning into all these kind of tropes, but doing it in a very clever and interesting way. Which blood number two? Out this week from Vault. Then we also have Shadow Service number seven. Really like this issue. It takes the main character, gives us a bit more of her backstory, and it sets up some interesting things that eventually have a turn toward the end of this book. That's got me very, very excited. I think there's only one to a few more issues left. It's nearing the end of its run, um, and this book has been fun. It's basically a spy movie mixed with magic, right? And that's pretty freaking cool. So MI666, get it? Um, the main character is a witch, but not really. She's got usage of magic. She's had it pretty much since birth, and there's some really twisty, turny things in here and some really horrific explanations on her past and why it and how that has affected her character's journey through this entire book. I've loved it. Shadow Service is like James Bond, but like a supernatural version of it, and it's pretty fun. Shadow Man number one is finally here from Valiant Comics. We've been waiting a long time for this. It's written by Cullen Bunn with artwork by John Davis Hunt. I absolutely love the artwork in this book. John Davis Hunt was the artist over at the Wildstorm, the one that Warren Ellis did a few years ago. Um, the artwork was always great. A great sense of composition, style, and flow, um, and action, all right? And you're getting all of that here in the midst of a really great supernatural story because that's what Cullen Bunn can do. 
I haven't been reading a lot of Valiant books lately, but Shadow Man is one I'm definitely going to stick with for a few issues because I was really intrigued by the premise, really intrigued by the setup, and the promise of where this book could go. Shadow Man number one, out from Valiant this week, and then look, we got My Little Pony Transformers back again, The Magic of Cybertron. This one is not as strong as the first issue of the first volume, but it is still delivering exactly what it promises, a charming, sweet, cute, and cuddly story of the Transformers mashing up with My Little Pony. And there you go. That's really all this is for. It's just meant to be goofy. It's meant to be cute. It's meant to be charming. And it fulfills all of those desires. So if you like the first series in any kind of way, I think you'll like this one because it's the exact same energy. It's the exact same vibe. My Little Pony Transformers, The Magic of Cybertron, number one. From AWA Upshot, we have the final issue of Erratic, Volume 1 at least, and I really liked this book. Care Andrews was able to craft a story that felt very similar to something like Ultimate Spider-Man. He's kind of making his own version of a Spider-Man character, but doing it a little bit different. Everything's not so squeaky clean, everything's a little bit more dirty, a little bit more real, or at least it feels real. I haven't been in high school in over 20 years, so I have no idea, but it feels real. Um, but I really did like this book. I liked the setup. Um, at the end, it was big, it was explosive, it was a nice heroic moment for Erratic. This was a great origin story. It's part of the Resistance world, but you don't have to read any of that stuff to get it. It's just a dude with powers. He's a kid with powers. He only has them for like, what, like 10 minutes at a time or something like that? Um, 15 minutes, something like 30? I don't know. Anyway, Erratic, number five, was the conclusion of the first volume. I think there's going to be another one coming because there's a lot of setup for what's to come, and I liked it. That was really solid. Also wrapping up this week was Dead End Kids Volume 2. That's the suburban job. What a great ending to what was really a great series. Frank Gogol was able to tell a story that's about these kids dealing with, with loss, dealing with trauma, and not do it in a preachy, on-the-nose kind of way, but do it in a very subtle, powerful way. And the last several pages of this issue were incredibly freaking powerful. Dead and Kids, The Suburban Job number 4, I thought was the best issue of the series yet. I thought that this was a better series than the first one, and I really liked the first Dead and Kids, but The Suburban Job, four, ep uh, four issues, all of them really solid. The characters were all um, perfectly encapsulated, uh, exceptionally realized by the artwork and by the writing. Um, I loved it. Dead and Kids, Suburban Job number four. Well done. Anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do like, subscribe, like, share, and subscribe. Click the notification bell, ding, 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 Herm, so you don't miss a single video. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcast blogs, and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station.